Hello, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Olympus OMD EM5 Mark III, an upper mid range mirrorless camera aimed at photography enthusiasts, videographers, and vloggers. And in fact, it's going to be so tempting for vloggers that I thought I would film all the pieces to camera in this video with the EM5 Mark III so that you can judge its quality as I tell you all about it. And it's also going to give me the opportunity to demonstrate it with a variety of lenses. And I'm starting off with the Olympus Pro. 12 to 100 millimeter f4 pair at 12 mil f4 and this lens and body combination is going to give you what olympus describes as its best stabilization experience up to six and a half stops of compensation but i'll talk about that more in the review later on so what are the headline features of this camera well you're getting a 20 megapixel micro four thirds sensor inherited in fact from the two flagship models in the olympus range the em1 mark ii and the em1x and this equips the em5 mark iii finally with phase detect autofocus which makes it very suitable for capturing fast action or just smoothly refocusing in videos hopefully you will see during these clips it also has built-in stabilization, not just any built-in stabilization, but arguably the best built-in stabilization in the business, beaten only by other models within Olympus's own range. It has a side hinged, fully articulated touchscreen, which combined with our autofocus system, stabilization and microphone input is what makes it so tempting for vloggers. And it's also one of the most weatherproof models on the market. So how much are you looking to spend on this camera? Well, it's probably a little bit more expensive than a lot of its rivals. It's about $1,199 or £1,099 for the body alone. And it's up against some tough competition, which initially look very, very tempting because they're cheaper, generally speaking, and have bigger sensors. So there's the Fujifilm X-T30 and Nikon Z50, both of which are coming in at around the $900 or pound mark for the body alone. Both of those cameras have got larger APS-C sensors, but they do not have built-in stabilization. I would argue that they are not as weatherproof and they don't have size hinge, fully articulated screens. Now there's also Panasonic's uh, Lumix G90 or G95 that does have a side hinge screen, great quality video, great stabilization, but it doesn't have phase detect autofocus. Hmm, now there is a camera which does appear to offer all of it, that's the Sony A6600, that uh, has a bigger APS-C sensor and built-in stabilization, but unfortunately in my test the stabilization has not proven as effective, the screen isn't side hinged, and it's more expensive too at about $1400. In fact, the model that's arguably closest, the biggest rival to the EM5 Mark III, is from Olympus itself, and that's the EM1 Mark II. Now, its RRP is higher, but because it's an older model, you should be able to find discounts that might only make it one or two hundred dollars or pounds more expensive. So I'm gonna compare a lot of the features during this video. Right, that's enough for this introduction. Let's get on with the rest of the features. Okay, let's start with build quality, design and controls. And for this segment, I've switched to the Olympus 17mm f1.8 lens, open to f1.8. Now, design is, of course, a very personal thing. But for me, the EM5 series always hit a sweet spot. You see, it roughly sits in between the entry-level EM10 and, until recently, the flagship EM1 series. And Olympus, on previous models anyway, would allow the EM5 to inherit a lot of the capabilities of that higher-end model, but repackage it into a much smaller, lighter and more portable body. And for me, the previous EM5 Mark II was essentially the perfect camera body. I mean, it was small, tough, had fantastic controls, great stabilization. And for me, Olympus had only one job, and that was to equip that lovely older body with the latest sensor from the EM1 Mark II and now the EM1X, thereby giving it the phase detect and confident autofocus it always deserved. Now it has done that, it has equipped it with that sensor, but in the four and a half years since the EM5 Mark II, Olympus has had a lot of time to think about positioning. And I think that perhaps it felt the EM5 Mark II was treading on the toes very slightly of the EM1 series, and it wanted to provide greater differentiation. And that means that the EM5 Mark III has lost a number of aspects that its predecessor had. Frustrating? Maybe, let's see. So first of all, some of the controls are actually now a bit more similar to the EM1 Mark II. 
Olympus has switched the position of the mode dial and now on the upper left hand side of the body you'll find a drive control and power switch that's very similar to that on the EM1 Mark II. You're also getting a bigger thumb rest that makes the camera easier and more comfortable to hold and I'm really pleased that Olympus has retained two really nice big chunky finger and thumb wheels on the EM5 Mark III. Now a lot of cameras when they get smaller well the controls get smaller and they're more fiddly and less comfortable and that's an aspect that people complain about rightly when they go from a bigger camera to a smaller one it's just not as comfortable to hold and use but Olympus has nailed it for quite a long time ago in fact it's produced some really small bodies that are really comfortable to hold and with very tactile very clicky dials nice and chunky beautiful to operate and the EM5 Mark III like its predecessor is a camera that you can very confidently hold and operate even one-handed especially with its very effective built-in stabilization so in those respects I'm absolutely delighted with what Olympus has done with the Mark III However, there are a few changes. The most obvious one is that the body is no longer metal. It's built of polycarbonate. And Olympus says it's done this to save weight. It wants to really push the mobility message for the EM5 Mark III. And indeed it is lighter than its predecessor, but only by about 55 grams. And that takes it from being a very light camera to a really very light camera. And to be honest, I don't think anybody actually picked up the earlier EM5 Mark II and went, lovely camera, shame it's a bit heavy. I think it was fine. Now, when you hold them side by side, you do notice that the new model is a bit lighter. It doesn't quite feel as dense in your hands. You know, you may or may not feel happy about the switch of body materials. You can't help but think that maybe that metal body might be tougher if you were to drop it. I've not dropped this camera, so I can't tell you. But what I have done is really tested it for weatherproofing. Now, when us reviewers, face a camera that claims to have weather sealing we always ask the manufacturers can we take it out in the rain can we actually pour water directly onto it and for the kind of mid-range type bodies a lot of companies can be slightly reluctant to let you do that they don't actually say don't do it but equally they don't encourage you to do it however olympus is the complete opposite it's the only company that i've worked with that says go ahead pour water directly on it. We don't mind to make sure there's a weather sealed lens, of course. So that's what I did. I took their invitation for the EM5 Mark III, poured water over it, and it was absolutely fine. And this is something that I would not feel confident doing with any of its rivals. So yes, there is a change in body material, but the controls still feel great, and it is still very, very weatherproofed. In terms of connectivity, there's been a few differences. Uh, the older EM5 Mark II had a PC sync port on the front. That's no longer present on the Mark III. That may or may not bother you, depending on whether you use external lighting. There's still a microphone input. And in fact, I'm using that now with the Rode Wireless Go. You can see the transmitter unit on my collar here. Now, the older EM5 Mark II also had a grip accessory that slightly boosted the height, gave you more to hold on to, and also uh, made that grip bigger. But crucially for videographers, it also featured a headphone jack. Very handy. Now, the M5 Mark III body is a slightly different shape, so it needs a new accessory. Olympus still makes a grip accessory for it. It still boosts that grip. It provides bigger controls out the front should you want to use those instead. However, the headphone jack is gone. And this is a feature that is present along with the PC sync port on the EM1 Mark II. So again, I think those removals have been there to greater differentiate it. Also, the viewfinder image is now smaller on the EM5 Mark III than it was before. I'll talk about that more in the next section. Again, I think to provide greater differentiation with the EM1 Mark II. In terms of uh, the battery, that's also changed. Olympus has fitted a smaller battery pack on the EM5 Mark III, but various power saving and uh, software optimizations means that the battery life is actually roughly the same as before. You're looking at about three to 400 shots in general use or around 110 minutes worth of video. That's uh, Olympus's official quote, which I've actually confirmed in practice. I managed to record three and a half 4K clips which were roughly half an hour long, so half an hour, half an hour, half an hour, and then about 15 minutes. So roughly 105 minutes of 4K video without any overheating issues. So I confirmed that. Now, in a really nice upgrade on the EM5 Mark III, you can now finally recharge the battery internally over USB. It is only micro USB though, and not USB-C. And unfortunately, you can't 
operate the camera, you can't power it over USB. And this is a feature that you can do with most of its rivals at this price point. So that's a little bit of a shame. And another thing that you won't be able to do on the EM5 Mark III that you can on most of its rivals is embed location coordinates over Bluetooth as you shoot. Now models from Canon, Panasonic, Sony, even Fujifilm now allow you to keep the camera connected to your phone over Bluetooth and just seamlessly set them up so that the camera retrieves the current position from your phone, embeds it on the picture as you take it. It's low power, it's extremely low effort, it just works. However, with the EM5 Mark III, Olympus is stuck with the older method where you would actually use the software to record a log of positions that you'd then synchronize with your photos later on. So not as smooth as its rivals in that regard. Oh, and in terms of memory, there's a single SD card slot. None of its rivals offer dual card slots at this price, unless you're looking at a heavily discounted Lumix G9, of course. Uh, on the plus side, I would, however, say that the Olympus EM5 Mark III houses its SD card slot on the side of the body, so it remains accessible, even when it's on a tripod, whereas most of its rivals, well, you access it through a rather inconvenient position in the battery compartment from below. Okay, now it's time to talk about composition. And for this segment, I'm sticking with the Olympus 17 mm f1.8 lens, opened all the way to f1.8. So hopefully I can blur the background nicely behind me. Um, the difference, of course, though, is that I'm walking and talking now. This isn't an ideal lens for vlogging with, but I wanted to try it anyway, and I promised you earlier on. So in terms of composition, the EM5 Mark III has switched its electronic viewfinder from an LCD panel to an OLED panel. It's 2.36 million pixels, which places it exactly in line with its rivals. That is par for the course for models at this price point. However, the magnification varies. Olympus uh, quotes 0.68 times for the EM5 Mark III, which is actually smaller than its predecessor, which is a bit of a shame. So when you switch from the Mark II to the Mark III, you actually get a smaller viewfinder image. It's not the smallest of its rivals though. The Fujifilm X-T30 has the dubious pleasure of that claim. That's the smallest of all, and that really does look pretty small to your eye, especially when you compare it to others. And uh, Nikon Z50, roughly similar, but the Sony A64 and 6600, that viewfinder image is larger or at least in terms of the quoted magnification. And it's important to look into it a little bit more deeply because these viewfinder panels have got a four by three, a fairly squarish aspect ratio, which actually matches the shape of the pictures that micro four thirds cameras like the Olympus and Panasonic bodies take. So when you're composing still photos with these cameras, the Olympus and Panis, that image actually fills the viewfinder panel, so it's very, very tall. Whereas when you're using uh, one of those APS-C cameras, they generally shoot in a wider three by two shape, which means that their viewfinder image is letterboxed slightly. So when I compared the Olympus EM5 Mark III side by side with the Sony APS-C cameras, yes, the greater magnification on the Sony's meant that their image was wider, but it wasn't as tall. So you've got to look beyond those specifications. I'd say it's actually in terms of the area presented to your eye, it's actually very similar to what the Sony's offer. Panasonic takes the lead though with its G90, G95 with a bigger viewfinder image that fills the panel. And of course, if you're going for a discounted Lumix G9, well, it's absolutely enormous. That remains one of the biggest viewfinders around. Okay, in terms of the screen, Olympus is stuck with a side hinged, fully articulated screen. I'm so pleased about that. Believe it or not, it's still one of the few cameras to offer that. I'm using it now. It's absolutely ideal if you're vlogging because it allows you to see yourself on the screen. Uh, but it's also perfect if you're composing at high or low angles, either in the landscape horizontal format or in the portrait vertical format. It's just so flexible. Now, I do understand there's some cons to it. You have to fold it out and then angle it to the desired position. And that is going to be slower and less discreet than a screen that only tilts vertically because those you can just flip out and flip back again. That makes them more discreet in like a street shooting environment, but I'd still trade that for the overall flexibility of a side hinge screen. So I'm very pleased that the EM5 Mark III has stuck with that. And it does place it in a fairly unique and exclusive club. Uh, the Panasonic bodies still have them, but none of its other rivals do. The Sony, the Fujifilm, the Nikon, they're all vertically tilting screens only. Olympus has also updated its software so that you can use the touch screen as a touchpad when you're composing through the viewfinder. That's something that's offered by pretty much every camera now, but it's still a nice feature to have, especially as the EM5 Mark III does not have an AF joystick. 
Now, I have read that some people thought that it was a little bit sluggish when they used it. That wasn't the case when I tried it. And even though you can't limit the area of the panel that is responsive, uh, I didn't find that my nose touched it by accident or operated it by accident. And I'm also a left-eyed shooter, so uh, my nose does often get in the way. So no complaints there. Thank you, Olympus, for sticking with a side hinge screen. Okay, now it's time to talk about what's arguably the highlight of owning an Olympus camera, and that is having the best built-in stabilization of the industry. And for this segment, I've switched to the Leica Lumix 25mm f1.4, open to f1.4, and this is the original Mark I version of the lens from back in the day. Now, Olympus pioneered built-in image stabilization that shifts the sensor to counteract camera shake, and to me, it is still ahead of all of its rivals. Panasonic is catching up. The stabilization on its latest bodies is very, very good, but I still feel that Olympus's system is better still. And both Panasonic and Olympus are way ahead of what Fujifilm and especially Sony are offering on their APS-C bodies. And it really does give you a massive benefit when you're shooting stills or video, and it does really transform the way that you can shoot. Now, Olympus is quoting five and a half stops of compensation on the EM5 Mark III with any lens you attach, absolutely any, new or old, you get five and a half stops. If you mount one of the few Sync IS compatible lenses that's available, then the camera can exploit the body-based stabilization alongside the optical stabilization in the lens. Now, this sadly doesn't work with Panasonic's optically stabilized lens, only the Olympus Sync IS compatible ones. The most common lens that you'll be doing this with is the 12 to 100 millimeter. And if you mount that on the EM5 Mark III, you'll extend its compensation to a whopping 6.5 stops. Now in practice, this is gonna allow you to handhold something like a 24 millimeter equivalent focal length at at least one second. Now in practice, I found that I could handhold a 24 millimeter equivalent at not just one second, but two seconds four seconds. In some cases, if I was holding the camera nice and steadily, I could actually achieve six second exposures handheld at 24 millimeter. And this really opens up two different aspects to still photography. The first is actually being able to do handheld long exposures. I'll show you that in a moment. But the second, which is really important if you have a smaller sensor, is being able to really use lower sensitivities almost all of the time. Now, when I was shooting with the EM5 Mark III, thanks to the built-in stabilization, I found that I was shooting almost entirely at 200 or 400 ISO. And that's the native sensitivity and one stop above that where the camera is performing at its best in terms of image quality. It's very easy for somebody outside of the system to say, hey, you know, it's got a small sensor. I've seen the ISO comparison test. It, it just doesn't compare very well to APS-C, say above 6400 ISO but you may not actually be using those high sensitivities as often as you think. Now, quick reality check. If you're taking pictures of subjects that are in motion and you want to freeze that action, you're gonna need a fast shutter speed, right? And if you're shooting in low light with a fast shutter speed, you're gonna need a high ISO. So if you want a clean result under those conditions, then you may be better off with a bigger sensor. However, if your subject is fairly static or completely static, like a building or a landscape, or you don't mind embracing some subject motion within the exposure, then the Olympus system can work really, really well for you. So I'll give you an example. Here is a long exposure that I took of a London bus driving past on Regent Street. There's nothing special about this picture at first glance because it's something that people have been doing with tripods for years, except I didn't use a tripod. This is a handheld shot at 24 millimeter equivalent using the 12 to 100 millimeter, and it's a four second exposure. Four seconds handheld. I mean, it still surprises me. I've been able to do this with Olympus cameras for several years now, but every time I do it, I still think, is this even possible? I can't believe that there is no camera shake in this sort of environment. And of course, I was also able to shoot at 200 ISO, so I've got a nice, clean, noise-free result, no tripod needed, dead easy. But before you even get to taking your picture, I find the built-in stabilization is invaluable when you're actually just composing, especially with longer lenses. Here's an example. So I fitted the Olympus 75mm f1.8. That's a lovely lens to the EM5 Mark III here. And without stabilization, you can see that when I'm composing the shot, there's quite a lot of wobbling. And, and I really like to frame very precisely. Now, if you half press the shutter release and kick in the stabilization unit, you can see how that image just becomes 
eerily steady and it allows you to make very, very fine adjustments to the composition, moving it left or right or up or down a little bit. Make sure that what you want in the middle is exactly in the middle. Rotate the body to make sure that that horizon is nice and straight. It is so useful to have and for me works much better than optical only systems. Beyond stills, it's also invaluable for video. Now, throughout this review so far, you've seen me vlogging, presenting my uh, pieces to camera in a vlog style using the EM5 Mark III and using the built-in stabilization to get rid of almost all camera shake as I walk around London and Brighton with it. However, it's also invaluable if you want to film a fairly static composition. So again, here's another example with a 75 mm 1.8 this time filming without stabilization, you can see this footage is pretty much unusable. And now here's a version with stabilization enabled and you can just hold that image almost completely still or pan very smoothly, look around the scene, explore that. It just really allows you to film and photograph so much more easily than without. So this remains an absolute highlight of the Olympus system. And for me, is one of the best aspects of the EM5 Mark III. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about lenses. And like all OMD and pen cameras to date, the EM5 Mark III is of course equipped with a micro four thirds lens mount, but it's important not to brush that aside and move on to the next section because this is one of the major benefits of buying into an Olympus or indeed a micro four thirds system from Panasonic, and that is having access to the oldest and most established and broadest native mirrorless lens catalog around. Believe it or not, Micro Four Thirds is now over 10 years old. And during that time, it means that Panasonic and Olympus and their various third parties who also develop lenses for it, once they've got all the bases covered, they can start having a bit of fun and doing some more exotic options. So now you find yourself in a position where you can buy just about any lens, focal lens, or aperture that you can think of, including some really exotic options, like the one I'm filming you with right now, which is the Olympus 8mm f1.8 fisheye. Now, how many other mirrorless camera systems have a fisheye lens available? As far as I recall, Sony, Fujifilm, Canon, Nikon, none of those guys do. But for Micro Four Thirds, there's not just one, but three that I can think of just off the top of my head. So it's having access to this enormous variety of lenses and then also having them all becoming stabilized is a real major benefit of going with an Olympus or of course a Panasonic Micro Four Thirds body. So what kind of lens works best on an EM5 Mark III? Well, it's a fairly compact body, so I would match it with a fairly compact lens, ideally, for me, one of the smaller prime lenses that's available, something like the Olympus 17mm 1.8 is a lovely match, as are the Leica 15 and 12mm lenses. In terms of zooms, there's tons of choices out there. The one that I started this video with was the Olympus 12 to 100. Now that lens is amazing in terms of range and the quality is very good. Personally speaking, I feel it's a little bit too big for this body, perfectly matched on the EM1 Mark II less so on the EM5 Mark III. I feel it's more comfortable with models like the Olympus 12 to 40 millimeter 2.8, or maybe the uh, Leica or Lumix 12 to 60 millimeter. But again, with Micro Four Thirds, you've got so many options to choose from. You can try a bunch of different lenses, and it's now old enough that there are a reasonable number of them available secondhand for you to pick up at cheaper prices. So in terms of lenses, I love Micro Four Thirds system. Tell me what you think. Throughout this video, you've heard me excitedly go on about how the EM5 Mark III inherits the sensor from the EM1 Mark II and the EM1X. And in this segment, I'm going to talk about what that means in practice to autofocus, drive modes, and also its practicality for shooting action. And this segment is filmed with the Leica Lumix 25mm f1.4 at f1.4. Now, by inheriting this sensor, the EM5 Mark III finally gets phase detect autofocus. And this is the technology that allows cameras to confidently know what direction to focus in and when to stop. Compared to contrast-based systems, which is what the earlier EM5 bodies and Panasonic's bodies use, they need to hunt a little bit at the end. It can do it very quickly, but it still needs to wobble back and forth to absolutely confirm that focus. Contrast phase detect, knows where to go and knows when to stop. And this generally makes it better for shooting action or shooting moving subjects in video in particular because that visible wobble can be a little bit distracting. 
Now in terms of actual drive speeds, you can shoot at a top speed of 10 frames per second with the mechanical shutter or 30 frames per second with the electronic shutter, but both of those are with single autofocus. If you want continuous autofocus, the mechanical speed falls to 6 frames per second and the electronic to 10 frames per second. Now Olympus also offers both of those electronic shutter modes, whether you're shooting at 30 frames per second with single autofocus or 10 with continuous in its pro capture modes. And what those allow you to do is actually keep up to 14 frames in a rolling buffer as you have the shutter half pressed. And then when you fully press it, it commits those to memory, thereby allowing you to effectively go back in time. Now, if you were shooting, say, at 10 frames per second with continuous autofocus, then 14 frames is going to give you roughly a second and a half worth of action before you press the shutter release. I find that absolutely great for capturing the exact moment, say, a bird takes flight. And I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. If you're new to the Olympus system though, you'll need to take a few minutes to learn the various icons to describe those modes. If you want to shoot in any of the electronic shutter modes, whether you want silence or those faster burst speeds, then you're looking for the icons with the tiny little heart next to them. If you see a tiny little diamond, that's the anti-shock modes, and those will introduce a small delay to avoid shutter shock. So you will see two versions typically of shooting at high speed, low speed, and in pro capture with both the electronic or the mechanical shutter. So you really do have to learn which is the mode that you want to use. In terms of autofocus tracking, you can enable a continuous with tracking mode. That allows you to place crosshairs over a target and it will follow them as they move around the frame. I found that quite effective when photographing cyclists, slightly less effective when photographing Brighton seagulls. But nonetheless, here's a couple of examples that I shot. First of all, some cyclists approaching. This is with mechanical shutter at six frames per second and using the 12 to 100 at 100 millimeter f4. And now for some seagull shots, again, a short burst at six frames per second with the 12 to 100. Now 12 to 100 at f4 is not gonna provide that much of a challenge in terms of depth of field. So here's some other bursts that are shot with the 75 millimeter at f1.8. Now earlier I mentioned how pro capture can be invaluable for capturing the moment uh, that say a bird takes flight because it can bag the last say second and a half's worth of action before you fully depress the shutter. So to show this in action, here is a seagull taking flight. Now I fully depressed the shutter release when it had already taken off and left the frame. But you can see here that I've got quite a few frames where it still appears to be thinking about what it's gonna be doing next, even though this is very much a split second piece of action. Now there's several cameras that offer this kind of technology in slightly different variations, but I really like the Olympus implementation and you can also shoot in RAW as well as JPEG. It's not capturing these frames from video, although it is using the electronic shutter to do it. And I should say that this is a feature that is not available on any of the Sony cameras to date. It's also worth looking at the maximum shutter speed. Now the EM5 Mark III has the fastest mechanical shutter of 8,000th of a second. And you might expect that kind of shutter speed for a camera of its price, but you may be surprised to find that Sony doesn't offer it on the a6600, which is more expensive. Fujifilm doesn't have it on the X-T30, you don't get it on the Z50 either. So in terms of its immediate peer group, none of them can match its top mechanical shutter speed of 8,000th of a second. In terms of the electronic shutter, you can also shoot faster still at up to 32,000th of a second, although do watch out for rolling shutter artifacts. As before, Olympus also offers a number of innovative bulb modes. If you turn the mode dial to its dedicated bulb position, you can deploy set bulb timers, which allow you to easily do exposures up to 30 minutes without the need for any accessories. There is also the live time mode, which lets you take peaks at the picture as you expose it. This is inviolable for long exposures because sometimes the exposure is complete before you've actually reached that maximum time that you thought you'd originally need. There's even a histogram that appears on the screen while you do it. And taking that even further is live composite, which can actually give different amounts of exposure to different parts of the picture. So for example, at a nighttime firework display with some foreground landscape elements, you could set the camera to expose correctly for the foreground and then ignore the foreground for the rest of the time and only record bursts of light either from fireworks 
or light painting. And to demonstrate that, here is a picture that I took under the instruction of Zolak, which is Z-O-L-A-Q. Follow them on Instagram. They've got some absolutely amazing light painting pictures. And this is one of the ones that they showed me how to do with the EM5 Mark III in live composite mode. The EM5 Mark III also inherits the neat keystone compensation of earlier models which allow you to correct for converging lines as you compose the shot. On the left is a normal image where I'm looking up at the building and you can see those lines converge while the one on the right was taken with keystone compensation enabled and again this actually lets you perform the correction as you compose the shot live. This isn't done in playback. New to the EM5 Mark III is fisheye compensation, designed specifically to correct the distortion of the Olympus 8mm f1.8 Pro lens for stills. You know, the one I vlogged with earlier while talking about lenses, although the correction only works for photos, not for video. Here's how the lens looks without correction, where you can see the massive distortion of a fisheye lens, followed by a selection of versions taken with the compensation settings. There's quite a few to choose from. Now they inevitably cropped the image but managed to correct for the extreme distortion while still capturing a big view. It's handy if you own that lens. Now for a selection of sample images, all JPEGs out of camera taken with the EM5 Mark III and a variety of lenses. With the same sensor as the EM1 Mark II and the EM1X, there's no big surprises here with a decent level of detail and attractive natural looking processing on out of camera JPEGs. Like earlier Olympus models, I personally feel the sharpening can be a little enthusiastic by default, but it's easy to turn it down a notch. Compared to rival models, there's actually very little difference in quality between the 20 megapixel Micro Four Third sensor and the 20 to 26 megapixel APS-C sensors, at least at lower sensitivities. So if you mostly shoot at low ISOs, whether in bright conditions or dimmer ones by exploiting the excellent stabilization, then I think you'd be satisfied. And if you desire a shallow depth of field, this is also possible with one of the many bright aperture lenses available for the system. The bottom line, I'm perfectly happy with the quality here. In order to combat the ever-increasing megapixels of larger systems though, the EM5 Mark III inherits the high-res shot mode which first made its debut on the Mark II, but is now available here with a boost in resolution thanks to the updated sensor. So like the EM1 Mark II, the high-res shot captures and combines a burst of images as the sensor shifts in order to generate greater detail and reduce moiré, all in camera and producing a file with up to 50 megapixels worth of information, although as before, you'll need to use a tripod and also avoid motion in the frame. Here's a crop from a resolution chart taken on the left with the standard 20 megapixel mode, while on the right is the 50 megapixel JPEG, which is clearly out-resolving it in terms of detail. It's an impressive start, but how does this translate into real life situations? First, here's a bunch of flowers with the crop on the left hand side taken with the normal 20 megapixel frame, while on the right hand side is the high res shot version. The difference is less obvious than the resolution chart, but look closely and there's definitely more detail on the high res version, proving its usefulness for still life in a controlled environment anyway. Outside, in a more dynamic environment, the high-res shot can certainly improve detail on the areas of the frame which remain static, like buildings, but anything in motion, such as people, vehicles, birds, water, even foliage blowing in the breeze, can result in artifacts. Some of these are acceptable, while others can look a bit weird or even ugly. The result really greatly depends on the subject, so use with caution outdoors, but knock yourself out in more controlled environments. Now for a run through the sensitivities, where the EM5 Mark III delivers clean results at 200 and 400 ISO, where I ended up using it the most thanks to the stabilization, with only minor losses at 800 and 1600 ISO. More significant reductions in quality occur beyond this at 3200 and especially 6400 ISO, and it's at this point that rivals with bigger sensors really take the lead. I'd personally avoid using the EM5 Mark III at these higher sensitivities if you want the best results, so the question you really need to ask yourself is just how often will you need to shoot above 1600 ISO, especially if you can exploit the stabilization to use lower ISOs instead. Obviously the ability to handhold slow shutter speeds to enjoy low ISOs is no good if you need to freeze motion in low light, but landscape and architectural shooters may find the system really satisfies their requirements. The Micro Four Thirds system also includes lots of very bright aperture lenses which help keep sensitivities down too. Okay, now it's time to talk about video and for this segment I've switched over to the Panasonic Lumix Leica 12-60mm f2.8-4. to I've got it at 12mm f2.8. I've switched off the optical stabilization in the lens because it doesn't always play nicely with the built-in stabilization in the body. So this is just body-based stabilization. 
Now, by inheriting the sensor from the EM1 Mark II and EM1X, the EM5 Mark III gains a lot of those video modes. So, as well as 1080 at 24, 25, 30, 50, or 60p, you now finally get 4K at 24, 25, or 30p at 102 megabits per second. You also get the slightly wider cinema 4K format, only in 24p, but at a higher bit rate of 237 megabits per second. And all of those modes you can record for a maximum of 30 minutes. I managed on one battery charge, three and a half 4K clips, so about 105 minutes worth before it expired. There was no overheating issues with that. Now, there are a couple of features that are missing on the movie mode in this camera. The first is that there is no real flat profile if you're into grading. If you want that, if you want a log profile, you're gonna have to go for the EM1 Mark II, or of course, you could go for one of Sony's cameras, which has S-Log. And while I'm talking about Sony, it's worth mentioning that uh, the A6400 and A6600 don't have any recording limit, neither does the Panasonic G90 or G95. And in fact, the Sony A6600 does have a very long life battery. I managed to get a single 4K clip on the A6600 that lasted about three hours and 20 minutes. So if you wanna record giant clips, that could be the model to go for. But for me, rather than grading or unlimited recording time, the feature that I really miss on the EM5 Mark III for movies is auto ISO in manual mode. You see, I like filming in manual exposure mode. It means I can fix the shutter speed. I want to fix the aperture for my lens. I don't want that to vary, so I've got this f2.8, but I do want the camera to balance the exposure using auto ISO, and most other cameras can actually do this. The Olympus is quite unusual in not supporting that feature. Now, I have heard some people say that there is a workaround, and that involves putting the camera into one of its still modes, let's say manual exposure for stills, at which point auto ISO is allowed, and then if you set, say, the exposure to 50th per second, f2.8, and auto ISO, but now sneakily press the movie record button, well, then the movie inherits those settings, except that didn't quite work when I tried it. What happened is when I pressed the movie record button in any of the still photo modes, even if it was full manual, well, the movie was actually recorded in program mode. Program mode does allow auto ISO, but it also adjusts the aperture and the shutter speed. So that's not ideal. Your mileage may vary. I'd, very, I'd be very interested to hear if you've had a different experience to me in this regard, but certainly officially speaking, no auto ISO for manual exposure movies. But otherwise, what you are getting is very good quality 4K, of course, coupled with that amazing built-in stabilization that you're seeing here. And also now with phase detect autofocus. So I wanna show you a clip now that I filmed in Bison Beer in Brighton, where I'm pulling focus between near and far using the touch screen and see how confidently the camera now focuses between near and far. This is something that it really struggled with before. Well, it didn't struggle so much, but it did wobble back and forth like most contrast systems. Now it is auto-focusing much more smoothly. And hopefully you've also seen that when you're vlogging with face detection on, you're getting a much more confident result. There's also high-speed video, which captures 1080 at 120 frames per second, before then interpreting it in camera to a lower frame rate for a slower speed. For example, outputting at 25p for a 4.8 times slowdown. And now, finally, for my final verdict. The earlier EM5 Mark II was one of my favorite all-round cameras, stylish with excellent controls, compact but comfortable, sporting a useful side hinge screen, good viewfinder, some innovative modes, and amazing stabilization. The only real downside to that model was its continuous autofocus, which fell behind rivals which had adopted more confident phase detect systems. So when the EM1 Mark II finally brought respectable phase detect autofocus to Micro Four Thirds three years ago, I immediately thought how it could transform the EM5 series. But due to a series of unfortunate events, it's taken until 2019 for it to happen. I feared this update may now be too little too late, but thanks to some questionable decisions made by its rivals, the EM5 Mark III actually becomes one of the more unique and compelling cameras in its category. Yes, the sensor is smaller and slightly lower resolution than most APS-C rivals, and the price higher than many mid-range models too, but look at what you're getting. Class-leading stabilization which transforms handheld video and lets you shoot at low sensitivities, coupled with arguably the best weatherproofing in its peer group, in addition to a side hinge screen which avoids hot shoe accessories, a microphone input, 
uncropped 4K video, a composite high res mode and a bunch of innovative long exposure options. There's literally nothing like it, at least outside of Olympus's own range. Some cameras come close but don't quite deliver the whole package. The Fujifilm X-T30 and Nikon Z50 give you larger APS-C sensors at a lower price but don't have built-in stabilisation or screens that face forward. Canon's EOS M50 is much cheaper while sporting an APS-C sensor and a side hinge screen and decent autofocus but its 4K is compromised, there's no weather ceiling and there's still no built-in stabilisation either. Panasonic's G90 or G95 sports the side hinge screen and decent built-in stabilisation but the 4K is cropped and the movie autofocus is just not as confident. Meanwhile, the increasingly discounted Lumix G9 has the side hinge screen, great stabilisation, a giant viewfinder, dual card slots, weatherproofing and 4K up to 60p and in 10 bit, but again the movie autofocus falls behind the best of its rivals. Finally, Sony's A6600 appears to have it all, at least on paper, with an APS-C sensor, arguably the best autofocus of its rivals, a screen that faces forward, unlimited 4K recording and built-in stabilisation. But the screen's blocked by hot shoe accessories, the stabilisation proved disappointing in my tests and it's also the most expensive model in this group. Indeed, it's revealing the major competition for the EM5 Mark III's whole package is the earlier Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II. Now, this is the next model up in the range, offering a slightly more capable feature set in a chunkier body at a higher retail price. But discounts over time have seen it fall, depending on where you live and what time of year it is, to sometimes only $100 more than the EM5 Mark III's launch price. Now in its favour the EM5 Mark III is smaller and lighter but the EM1 Mark II isn't exactly large or heavy and for me actually feels better in my hands while also sporting some features I'd find useful like a larger viewfinder, headphone jack and twin memory card slots. If you're thinking about the EM5 Mark III early on in its life before it starts enjoying any discounts I'd say check prices very closely on the EM1 Mark II as it could make more sense overall. While the shared autofocus system on both the EM5 III and EM1 II is very respectable though, I did find in my own test that Sony's was better still, especially in movies for focus pulls and face tracking. There's also no getting away from the fact that rivals with larger sensors will deliver lower noise at high sensitivities, so if you really need to freeze motion in low light and desire the cleanest results, then Micro Four Thirds may not be for you. But again, below 1600 ISO, you won't notice much difference. Ultimately, the EM5 Mark III becomes one of the most compelling cameras at its price point, testament to how good the series had already become, but now enhanced further with Olympus's best sensor to date to deliver a big upgrade in continuous autofocus. I'd have personally liked it even more with auto ISO for manual movies and location tagging over Bluetooth, features that are both common on its rivals, and I'm also a little frustrated that greater differentiation in the range has arguably driven the loss of some features from its predecessor, most notably the metal body, larger viewfinder and some connectivity of the EM5 Mark II is now gone. But the controls and weatherproofing remain arguably the best in its peer group and the stabilisation remains unrivaled too, which in turn allows you to handhold surprisingly slow shutter speeds and deploy low ISO sensitivities where the sensor performs similarly to larger models. Again, if you really demand lower noise above 1600 ISO or the most confident movie autofocus then there are better options out there, but as an overall package it's hard to find a more or better rounded camera than the EM5 Mark III. Once again, do compare it closely with the higher-end EM1 Mark II, which, with discounting, can come close to the launch price of its newer sibling and simply makes more sense in the short term. But over time, the EM5 Mark III will settle into becoming one of the most desirable cameras in its category and proves there's still plenty of life left in the Micro Four Thirds system. Right, that's it for this video. If you got this far, thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you found any of it useful, please do like, subscribe, and remember to click that notification bell so not to miss any of my reviews or tutorials. If I've saved you any money or helped your camera choice, you can treat me to a coffee or treat yourself to my in-camera book or perhaps a Camera Labs t-shirt. As always, there's links to absolutely everything, including the latest pricing in the comments below. Speaking of which, let me know what you think of the M5 Mark III and also this longer review format. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.